Hello again folks. Today we're going to be covering section 5.2 and 5.3 primarily with some reference to 5.5. Five. Here's a quick view of the calendar. This video will be for Thursday, June 2nd. So 5.2, 5.3 five, and 5.5 five. is on the agenda. Basically 5.5 five is um, a lot of uh, theory um, that is oddly placed after the things that it's util the theory is part of. Um, so I'll be just taking things from that. Anyhow, here is the packet for today. Um, this is an overview of basically section 5.2 and 5.3. Um, I'll go into that in a few minutes. This is um, the third incarnation of this diagram. It's much more comprehensive, as you can see. I changed a couple of things, so I'm going to point them out when we get to it. These are features of a graph, things to bear in mind while you're trying to draw. There is, uh, again, some graph paper, which you can print. It already has the axes. This is something I've dug up from an older diagram. You, if you had been following in section, I think it was 2-2, um, there was uh, a PDF I made it a long time ago, different methods for graphing. This is really the most brute force method of graphing, which is to generate your own coordinates, your own points. Um, but when you're doing something like polynomials, this is to your advantage to have that technique on hand. So there's a table just to help you get started. And this is a slightly more sophisticated one, specifically for polynomial functions. And that's it. All right. So if you're following along, as always, please print this, and we'll get to it. Let me put this here. And I'll fire up the projector. Right. Um, let me actually, before I do that, I it, it occurred to me that maybe there's some terminology that should be squared away. Um, know these terms. All right. This is new multiplicity. You'll be seeing this later. But there's degree, uh, which, uh, not to insult you, you know, you want to make sure that you understand that degree is referring to basically the exponent. All right, but there's certain conditions, you know, uh, that I'm going to show you uh, on a slide in a moment. You would like, ideally, to conform to good etiquette, you know, basically having your polynomial in descending order. And you want to pay attention to the lead coefficient, basically the numbers sitting in front of the very first variable. All right, the variable with the highest degree. Right. Now, here is an old diagram to illustrate degree. Get this out of the way. if this is next in terms of the volume and the screen setting. Yeah. I think that's reasonable. All right. All right. Um, in reference to degree, right? here you have uh, a polynomial that is what would be referred to as descending order. All right. A lot of times when you're, you're doing these problems, and you're looking for the degree, they might give it to you jumbled. So um, a good rule of thumb, a habit to do almost automatically is to put something in descending order. Descending order just being that the exponents would be diminishing from left to right. right? Now, there's degree of the individual terms, things separated by plus or minus, and then there's degree of the entire uh, polynomial, the whole kit and caboodle. All right? If you would analyze this first term here, x to the third, all right, the degree would simply be the exponent, which would be 3. Right? And likewise, the degree of this one would be 2, and this would be 1, and this would technically be 0. All right? We're going to be considering degree of the whole polynomial for section 5.3 in particular. All right? And in that event, it's always going to be the highest one. All right, the highest available. Now, I have to say some because there's a technicality over here, but um, you're not going to see situations where you have two different variables, really, not, in, not now. Um, but there is something in theory. 
Anyhow, the degree of this polynomial would be the highest one, namely 3. Right. Now here's the technicality. Right. If you had a polynomial that was consisting of two different variables, x and y, in order to figure out the degree of the first term, the second term, the third term, subsequently, you would have to add them, which, just bear in mind, that's not the same thing as the product rule. The product rule would be adding exponents that have the same bases. So as for example, x squared times x to the third would be x to the fifth. You would add these, all right? That's the product rule of exponents, right? This is something, you're not really allowed to add these for the sake of, um, what's the word, using an abbreviation, if you will, right? But if you wanted to figure out the degree, more of a qualitative aspect rather than a quantitative aspect, all right, you would add 3 plus 1 in spite of the difference of the letter. So the degree here would technically be 4, this would be 3, this would be 2, and this would be 0 again. All right? And the polynomial degree would be the, the highest sum, so it would be 4 in that case. Right? You're not going to see things like this, right? but it is theoretically you know, something that exists. All right? Anyhow, be mindful of the degree of a polynomial, and again, it's the highest degree that is available. Okay? All right. Now, as far as a new slide is concerned, I made this yesterday evening. Uh, let me back this off. No, it's not the way, is it? All right. This is a summary, basically, of you know what? It might be better that way for now. All right. This is a summary of the information relevant from section 5.2 and 5.3, respectively. It's a little bit backward, but let me just add this uh, notation here. My polynomials, although they mentioned in section well before chapter 5, um, the information that you see here, this is 5.3. Right? And that, the stuff that is underneath is part of the picture. Um, the power function right, is in reference to section 5.2. Now, they look remarkably similar because they are related, but here's the difference. Right? A polynomial you might think of as being made of some building block. Right? And the building block is an individual term. Right? The conditions of which are that the lead coefficient, this is the number that would be sitting in front of the x, um, it has to be real, meaning no square root of negative 1 here. And the condition of the integer, uh, pardon me, the exponent, would be that it is non-negative, which is a phrase that summarizes it either being 0, technically, or something that is a positive whole number. All right? And it could be, as you can see from the ellipses, several terms. All right? A polynomial function could be made of one term, technically, or it could be multiple terms. All right? And it would still qualify as a polynomial. It's really these two conditions that would solidify it as being polynomial per se, right? Non-negative integer here, real coefficient, right? If, on the other hand, you have a power function, um, you can see there's a lot of similarity here. Power functions are one term, right? There's nothing else. And it is a lot less strict when it can, comes to the exponent. The exponent could be basically any real number that you would insert there. That means that, in theory, this is a terrible rip, all right? Um, this could be a half, all right, as an exponent, which means it would be square root, all right, in the radical style, all right? Um, it could be negative 1, which means it would be rational if you were to convert it, right? Um, and it would still qualify as a power function, all right? Anyhow, in either case, all right, the degree of either would still be the highest degree that is available, so um, of the variable, that is. Right? So in a situation like I've scribbled here, the, the degree would be negative 1, technically. Right? Or a half, or two, whatever you like. All right? In the case of a polynomial, if it's several, again, it's always the highest number. And it has to be non-negative. Now, let's focus on this, the power function, for a moment. In that event, let me just turn off my projector. Right, I want to show you what the graphs would basically look like. Uh, a little bit of white would be nice. 
There you go. It is still the afternoon as I am recording this. Now, um, of the power function, uh, one thing to be aware of is when you have an even degree, how that will affect the graph, and when you have an odd degree. Um, here's two pictures. Um, if you could draw a very simple T-shaped diagram, or shapes, there you go. Uh, y, X, Y, X is the origin in all cases, right? The most basic um, even degree would be, uh, that is a power function, would be simply Y equals X squared, right? right? Which as we know is the square function from toolkit parent uh, uh, functions. And it's just a parabola shape, an old parabola, right? So which means that it would look like this, sort of that hybrid UV shape again, right? And the points that would be good to know, all right, in the most basic form of this would be negative 1, 1, uh, 0, 0, and 1, 1, all right? If you were going to tweak this just ever so slightly, the next even degree after this would naturally be... Um, oof, that's stubborn. y equals x to the fourth, right? Go from two to three, naturally, right? The effect on the picture, right, and you could take it with your calculator to get, to illustrate, is that it would be virtually identical. I mean, it would go through the same points, right? But it would just be a little bit flatter. Right? So expect that. If it was x to the sixth, the next one, it would still go through those points, but it would be, again, flatter and flatter and flatter. It would be less than a, of a point, so to speak. All right, here's proof. All right, if you take your calculator, clear, get the junk out of there, go to y equals, uh, just insert x squared. You know that that's what the graph would look like. I have it zoomed in a little bit. This is a nice parabola, right? Um, if you put in x to the fourth, I'm going to use the caret symbol in this case, four, scoot on out, and then graph. You see that it goes through the same points, right? Regardless, right? I'm going to purposely delete the top one, just not to have it in the way. Right, and go back to the graph. Here's that flatter incarnation of a parabola. All right, hit trace. All right, and you could see that it goes through the origin. If I put in one, not three, sorry. If I put in one, still goes through one one. All right. If I put in negative one, it goes through one. Same points. All right. If you were, again, if you wanted something more complicated, you know, just set this so slightly, the next degree to the sixth. There is even a flatter version of this. All right. Trace, check the points. Not that, sorry, I hit the wall button. At the point of one, still one, right? Negative one, still one, all right? That's all it's really gonna accomplish. If you change this degree to the next even number, it's gonna get flatter and flatter and flatter, okay? A similar effect will occur when you're dealing with the odd degrees, right? So try to think of um, not just the linear one, but that would technically be the lowest odd uh, power function, right? If we had this, y equals just x, right? Uh, the identity function, all right? That's just gonna be a line, of course, right? Through the origin, through uh, zero, zero, through one, negative one, all right? 
Let's think of something that's just a little bit more elegant, perhaps, than a line. After one, three, all right? It's sort of the staying alive, you know, um, graph that looks like this, all right? Again, it would be good to commit to memory the points of interest, one, one, zero, zero, negative one, negative one, all right? What you can expect when you go to the next odd, y to the fifth, x to the fifth, is that it will be, again, a slightly um, flatter version around the origin, all right? But it should still go through. Okay, well, I'm gonna get rid of this red. Um, it should still go through these points, right? Right? It's again flatter. All right, around the origin. Not the best drawing, sorry. I didn't go, it's a little bit better. All right, but it's still the stay alive kind of uh, posture, if you will. Here is x to the fifth to illustrate. A slightly flatter version of x cubed. All right, uh, hit trace, check out some points. Here's one, still one, one, right? Negative one, negative one, negative one, as to be expected. <coughs> okay. Right, now let me get back to the other page the diagram that I had shown you before. Um, now, you know what, let me show you my big, the, the modification that I made from my uh, features of the graph overview. I think that would be better. So I'm gonna switch gears and go to this one. This has been under development for a couple of weeks now, as you may remember. All right, and I've added some stuff to it. All right, I have to amend something. Uh, in an earlier incarnation of this picture, all right, I was referring to the even and odd functions, all right, in reference to the arrows. Even and odd functions do have some bearing on arrows, all right. Namely, even functions have something called horizontal symmetry, so the arrows would be in the same orientation. But I tried to make this a separate category. There's something else in addition that you have to consider, whether you have an even degree function, which is not the same thing as having an even function. All right? Remember, even functions is something that conform to this model, that if you change the input to a negative, it still produces the same result, whether it's a negative input or a positive input. All right? And the odd would be a negative and a negative additionally here and here. All right? Anyhow. This is really the new stuff, and it's really what's important right now, right? If you've determined the degree of the polynomial as being an even, all right, then you have an even degree function, right? In that case, you would expect that the arrows should be the endpoints, the end behavior, if you will, all right, would be in the same general direction, right? Then I could be pointing in exactly the same direction, but both up, say, or both down, right? Depending upon whether you have a negatively coefficient or not. If you've determined that you have an odd degree, as in the case of the staying alive from earlier, right? You understand I'm referring to, uh, you know, uh, Saturday Night Fever, that old movie, all right? The arrows would be one up and one down, like one of each, okay? In either case, uh, the lead coefficient, if it happens to be negative up in the front, it's going to still preserve that you're going to have the same direction or one of each but it will cause a vertical reflection, so they'll flip, all right? What was up will be down, what was down will be up, all right? 
if both of them are up, then both of them will be down. Okay. All right. Now the other things that I've added to this, all right, are the local behavior includes the x-intercepts. Right. You already know that. Right. The intercepts can have a couple of conditions, though. Right. The points that are the x-intercepts may be just touching the x-axis. All right. In which case, you might refer to them as bouncing off of the x-axis. All right, or it might just be crossing right through it. In the case of y-intercepts, that's usually the case. They're just crossing through the y-axis, right? There's a formula down here that it helps to validate a suspicion more than anything else. It's not really that concrete in, in, in terms of your satisfaction, right? The number of zeros, of alternative name for x-intercepts, um, you can get an inkling about if you know the degree as well. So the number of x intercepts would either be exactly the same as the degree, so if you see degree 3, then you expect 3 x intercepts, or something just less than that, maybe 2, maybe 1. Right. Um, the turning points, all right, which are the minima and the maxima, essentially, these are points of change, remember, where uh, the function will go from, say, increasing to decreasing, all right? Um, or vice versa, all right? This has a similar looking formula, if you will, that again, it's not really something to give you a, a real warm fuzzy feeling, but it kind of validates the suspicion that you might have. The n is less than or equal to d minus one. So again, if all that you know is the degree of your polynomial, right, then what you can anticipate is that the number of turning points, minima or maxima, or one of each, or both, all right, would be something just one less than the degree. So if your degree is 3, then you might expect a maximum of two turning points. If your degree is 1, then you would expect no turning points. Okay? These two things are new. All right? They have something called continuity and smoothness. It's really not going to have a you know, large bearing on our graphs today, but continuity is the situation where your graph has no holes in it. Right? There's no gaps. Right? It's nice and un unbroken lines or curves. Um, smoothness is when there are no sharp corners, right? So there's, it's just curves, all right? So the one example I can think of with, that would not have some smoothness would be the absolute value function. Y absolute value of X is a V shape, right? All right, that's something that is not smooth, right? Because of that, um, the, the point, right? And the solid sides here. A parabola, in spite of the fact that it has a vertex, is considered smooth. All right? All right? All right. Um, so, as you're going through graphing, all right, there's a couple of things to pay attention to. Maybe put a, a number next to these things. All right? Pay attention, firstly, to the degree of the polynomial, because that will decide, ultimately, what the sketch would basically look like. Um, pay attention to um, whether it's even or odd in tandem with the, um, the vertical reflection, uh, pardon me, the uh, lead coefficient, because that will ultimately decide the direction of the arrows being both the same up, both the same down, one of each, or flip the other way. All right. And then pay attention to uh, the intercepts. Uh, especially the x-intercepts, okay? So your focus is really these three areas while you're graphing, okay? And you could utilize these to just, again, kind of confirm a suspicion that you might have, right? Or at least lead you in the right direction. Um, let's see. Now what I want to get into is uh, back to that other diagram. So let me change the slide for a moment. The overview diagram for today, uh, which is this, the bottom half of this. All right.
Um, when we get into graphing polynomials, right, this uh, what you see here. This is for graphing uh, polynomial functions. Right now, we did technically graph polynomial functions when we were talking about quadratics, because they're an example of a polynomial. But this is one that is slightly uglier. Notice that this is, bears some resemblance to the intercept form, right? It has obvious factors to it, right? It is similar to the intercept form of a quadratic, right? Intentionally so, because what's the benefit of knowing the intercept form of a quadratic is that you could, if it is in fact a form, completely fact and form, then you could pluck out what the x intercepts would be, right? So if in theory you had something worse than a quadratic degree three or higher, as long as it is factorable, all right, you can get to that information. Now what I tried to make it obvious is that you want it to be completely fact and form, all right? This is just a model, right? Notice that it has an A up in the front, right? That's the lead coefficient. Again, this ultimately decides um, if it's negative or positive, if it's vertically uh, reflected or not, right? The number that would be sitting on the inside of these factors in these positions, those are your zeros, all right? They're the x-intercepts, right? Then there's another quality here which is new, and it, it, it incorporates that word that I alluded to earlier, multiplicity, all right? Basically, these exponents that you would see here, labeled P, all right, they reveal the behavior near the x-intercepts, all right? This is known as the multiplicity, these P values, all right? They're the degree of the factors, all right? That's the most important thing. Multiplicity is the degree of the factors. So if you understand that degree is referring to one exponent, then if you could just look at the factors, whatever numbers are sitting there, that's the multiplicity, right? Now in a nutshell, how does that affect the behavior near the x-intercepts? Depends on if you have an even multiplicity or again, if you have an odd multiplicity. All right, let me scoop this down just a wee bit. If you have an even multiplicity, Let me get that out of the way. If you have an even multiplicity, the function would appear to bounce off the x-axis. Right? If you have an odd multiplicity, then the function should, in theory, cross through the x-axis. There is this other thing. This is really what is part of section 5.5 five that is relevant to 5.2 and 5.3, the intermediate value theorem, all right? The intermediate value theorem is basically used to predict the existence of an x-intercept, all right? Here's how you would read this. If you evaluate a function at the point of A and you evaluate a function at the point of B, A and B are x's, and they produce the op opposite sign y values, meaning the outcome here is a positive maybe, and the outcome in this case is a negative, all right? Then there is an x value in between those x's a and b, for which if you evaluated using it, would produce y equals zero. Remember, function notation f of x is just another way of saying y, right? That means that there's an x-intercept. The intermediate value theorem is basically used to predict the existence of an x-intercept. That's all it's good for, all right? And that, again, is as much of 5.5 that is relevant right now. Sorry. All right. Now, let me draw you a little picture, and then we'll do some examples. To really... Um, get you comfortable with multiplicity. Here's another diagram. Multiplicity. Um, degree of the factor. Not well, that's visible. Um, there's again, an even multiplicity. an even p-value, 
and there is an odd p value potentially. And there'll be whole numbers, that's really all that we're concerned with when we're dealing with polynomials. All right. Here again, draw uh, two simple cross shaped diagrams to summarize. In this case, I'll do two. Again, think of the most basic version of an even degree. All right. Is the uh, square function again, right? I know that it doesn't look factored, but just imagine for a second that it was wrapped in a parenthesis, then it would technically be factored, right? And here would be the degree. This would be the p-value. All right. You know that a parabola were it to be drawn would look like that, right? And in that instant, instance, it's just bouncing off of the x-axis, really. It's just touching it, all right? All evens will behave that way. Right? If you have an odd, you can think of the most easy odd uh, example y equals x to the first, right? A linear equation, the identity function. Again, it's not factored, in, maybe if you don't put a parenthesis, but there you have it. Um, then you know it would be exactly through the origin of one, one, zero, zero, negative one, negative one. What is it doing? It's crossing the x-axis at that intercept, which coincidentally happens to be the y-intercept, right? What if you had the stay alive, you know? Ha, 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 stay alive. All right, x to the third, all right? That hand gesture of up and down like this. All right, it's still behaving in a similar fashion, namely it's crossing the x-axis. So armed with that information, right, if you had ultimately to write a polynomial function based upon a picture, you can make assumptions about what the degree will be of the factor, right, based upon whether it's bouncing or crossing. Good to know. Right. Let's do a couple of examples. All right. Can I clean this up? you were given this function f of x is equal to negative 4x times x plus 3 times x minus 1. This is something that is already factored. Right. Let's determine behavior. Given this, determine behavior. All right. Uh, specifically, arrow behavior. So that would be the end behavior. Talk about the intercepts, the local behavior. And maybe some turning points. All right. First thing we would do, and so far as the arrows are concerned, is we would have to notice the degree of the polynomial and the lead coefficient. I would be erring on the side of caution. What I would do in this case is that I would distribute all of this to get it into the uh, more or less the general form of a polynomial. So something in descending order. Right? You can make some assumptions based upon what would be the degrees here, here, and here, but I would just I think it's just better safe than sorry. Do the distribution. Right? So in this case, 
Um, you notice that you have a, a foil to do here, and then you could distribute by that. So x x squared minus 4x plus 3x minus 12, and there would be this minus 4x on the outside. You could clean it up a little bit, of course. Minus 4 plus 3 is just minus 1, really, is this middle term. Then distribute 4 to these three components, all right, negative 4. Uh, x to the x squared would be negative 4x cubed plus 4x squared plus 48x. All right, now, um, now that we have it completely expanded here, all right, we'll pay attention to the degree, all right? This is an odd degree. The lead coefficient, uh, pardon me, the lead term is the degree of the polynomial here, at least if it's in um, descending order. So good etiquette, three, two, one, all right? Um, so if this is odd, we would expect uh, one arrow up and one arrow down. All right. Maybe while we're doing this, I'll put uh, some kind of a sketch here. Right. Based upon that, one arrow up, right, and one arrow down. Now, in addition to that, there is this negative lead coefficient. So since it's negative, that means it's going to be vertically reflected. It's going to flip. So if it was in fact oriented like that and that, instead what it would be is this point would be up here and this point would be down here. One of each, but flipped like so. I'm going to be a little short on space, so I'm probably going to have to erase stuff. All right. um, if you consider now the intercepts, the x-intercepts, if we are concerned about the zeros, otherwise known as zeros, uh, we could get some idea of how many there would be, right? Again, there's this formula, which takes into consideration the information we just gleaned, uh, what the degree would be. So we can at least anticipate what would be. This is already in facted form, so we really don't have a lot of work to do, all right? But if we determined that the uh, degree was in fact three, then the number of x-intercepts, otherwise known as zero, would be three or less, all right? It looks like since there are three factors here, that factor, that factor, and that factor, that that would make perfect sense. It's exactly three, all right? The factored form reveals three exactly, all right? That's again, just to confirm a suspicion we may have. Now, how do we get that? You take the factored form, and just like when you were dealing with quadratics, if something is factored, apply the zero product rule. So, um, if this is factor one, and this is factor two, and this is factor three, and we set this equal to zero just to our advantage, right? Because that's what y would have to be. All right, we could write three smaller equations, all right? Minus 4x is equal to 0, x plus 3 is equal to 0, x minus 4 is equal to 0. Because in theory, three things multiplied together, if they end up being 0, one of them could be 0, or three of them, two of them, whatever. So, if you simplify this, divide by negative 4, you get x is equal to 0, which is the ordered pair, 0, 0. 0 because that's what a y, an x-intercept would have to be, the y value. All right, that's 1. So you would definitely have a dot here. 
in this instance, you would have to subtract three, right? Cancellation effect, x would be equal to negative three, which makes the next one would pay at negative three comma zero, which means you'd have an increment one, two, three, a dot there roughly. And one more, plus four, x would equal positive four, which is the location of zero comma four. So one, two, three, four, you'd have a dot roughly there, okay? Three x-intercepts, all right? And we can confirm that, right? What, what the suspicion was, all right? Factor form will dictate, right? Now, um, you really don't have to worry about the y-intercept because the y-intercept is coincidentally you could see it. Zero, zero. Right. Um, if you wanted to check just to, you know, you, because you feel uncertain, remember what would you do? To, to attempt to calculate a y-intercept, what do you do? You put zero in place of x's instead. Right. So what would that be? Right. Let's call this y up here. You'd put a zero there, that would be zero. This would end up being three, and that would be negative four, but zero times anything is still gonna be zero. So it's, it's unnecessary. Right. Now, uh, what we'll consider is the multiplicity at this point. Again, I'm a little short on space, so uh, let me Erase this, please. Definitely a disadvantage of working at home. All right. Remember the multiplicity. All right. That reveals the behavior around the x-intercepts. Namely, if they're uh, just bouncing, even would be bounce, all right, and odd P would be across. So in fact, it forms, sorry for the scribble here. I'll try to clean that up just a little bit. Here is the original thing in fact, it form. What are the degrees if they're not written? Okay. Um, one, one, and one. Right. Which means that at the intercept that is the zero, this one is where zero, zero came into play, this factor, that it would cross um, through here, right? Now, I don't want to make the assumption that it's in this direction or this direction quite yet, but it would have to cross for sure, right? According to an odd multiplicity, an odd P, which we could assume is there if it's not written, right? At this factor of X, uh, which ends up being negative three, comma zero, again, it would have to cross. Now, now we can make some assumptions. We already decided what the orientation of these arrows would be. So yes, indeed, it's gonna cross through here, and I'm just gonna connect it to the arrow that I have generally up there, all right? In order for it to cross this way, and then back through here, it's not gonna be oriented like that. Now it would have to be that way, right? Which means that it would have to turn to cross at that point, right? Side note, and this is in reference to three here. Remember the turning points can be predicted or give you some idea of what the maximum would be, it would be uh, the degree minus one. So we already determined the degree would be three, so three minus one would be two, 
So the number of turning points would be two or less, all right? There's one of them. There's a turn right there, all right? It would have to be in order for this to cross back that way, all right? Now, just to complete this thought from earlier, the last factor, right, the, or the uh, pardon me, the x-intercept zero would end up being uh, four comma zero, right? So the multiplicity is uh, an odd, so it would definitely cross at that point, which would make sense because the arrow is down here anyway. And in order, since it was increasing at this stage, it would have to turn. We would infer that, all right? So there is another turning point. There's a cross, a cross, and a cross, all right? And it seems, therefore, based upon the orientation of the arrows and this formula, which uh, gives us an idea would be two or less, this number of turning points would be um, exactly two. And you'd have a picture that looks something like that. Now, just to confirm, use your calculator. All right. Just here for a moment. And you can enter the, the facted form of this. So I'm going to clear this out. Here's our calculator. I'm going to enter this gobbledygook that is here a little bit more clearly. Use the um, minus symbol that's down here rather than minus here for the lead coefficient for uh, x parentheses, x plus three parentheses, parentheses, x minus four, close the parentheses. So x minus three, close a second one adjacent, x minus four. Oh, sorry, I'm reading it backwards. Plus, there you go. plus here, minus here, four, close it. I'm just gonna look at it correctly. Looks good. All right, so you should see something like that. This is what we predict the picture to look something like. All right, so I'm gonna graph, and we'll see what we get. This is a little too zoomed in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the uh, zoom button to automatically go to standard six. And you'll see a better picture, hopefully. That's still kind of crummy. Try five square. Yeah, I'm not happy with that. Um, try zooming in now to have to hit enter. It's a little exaggerated, but it is the same picture. Ah, uh, Z-Fox. Sometimes you can befuddle with your calculator. In which case, turn it off. And then turn it back on. <laughs> and then hit graph again. Ah, uh, jeez, I just want the satisfaction of seeing it. Zoom fit. Zoom fit is an option from a little bit lower to get a better picture. Uh, 
Um, I'm not satisfied with this, so I'm just going to kind of force it. When in doubt, all right, if you hit window, if you can't get it to automatically do a nice picture for you, zooming wise, go to window, you can change the uh, dimensions of your graph. Um, to me, it really shouldn't be that bad, you know. So I'm going to say negative 10, not even, negative 5, that's bad. It's a positive 5. Scale of one, the Y minimum, I'll just make, um, I'll see if it needs to be that much. I didn't calculate what the minimum would be. Here's a little bit better, having tinkered with that. As expected, it was something similar to what's predicted. All right. One thing I didn't specify was the minimum and the maximum. All right. This would uh, turning point here would be a minimum technically, and this would be a maximum. Right. What you would do if you wanted to zero in on this the most brute force way is figure that okay, if if as far to the left as I would like to look is negative three, and the other turning point. Uh, after, uh, pardon me, the x-intercept after the turning point is zero. You could try uh, inserting an x value, all right, into the original function to see what the y ought to be, and you get closer and closer and closer to it, all right? Otherwise, I mean, if it was a nicer view, all right, and I could try zooming out just a little bit here. Three. You can have your calculator, there you go, thankfully. You can have your calculator tell you the minimum, that turning point location, uh, by choosing second and then trace. All right, here's the, firstly, choose the minimum, so three, and then play the game of, all right, well, you got to tell it how far to look, all right? This would be as far to the left as you would look, potentially just past the, the little valley, hit enter and then scoot over to just a little bit past that valley. That's the, as far to the right as you want it to zero in on, and then you say, yes, I'd like you to guess, please. Ah, uh, pressing buttons when I should. Sorry, this is what happens when you do things backwards. And it gives you um, its estimate here negative 1.7 almost, all right, it would be down to, you know, 50, negative 50. That's why the screen proportions are an issue, all right, so you could try that, negative 1.7, just about negative 50. It's not a nice number, unfortunately, it's a decimal number. Right. Okay. And the same thing with the, uh, the, what would be the maximum? It would have to be somewhere an x value in between this x intercept and this x intercept. So, brute force, if you're doing it by hand, all right, put in a number between zero and four, two, you know, roughly, if you're going to estimate. All right, and that would give you some idea. Here's the graph again, just out of morbid curiosity. <laughs> if I hit uh, trace and get the x values up here. I'm going to, I'm going to say, well, I estimate that it's probably around two for X. So what would the Y be? Quite high up, 80. Just a smidgen more. All right, 82 point something, you know, and then it goes down again. So that's just about where it would be. Okay. All right. Um, let's sketch again, because it's an interesting thing, um, with something that hasn't been factored. So our feet are pretty wet at this point. Yuck. I hate wet feet. Uh, but we have an idea. We have a strategy for graphing. And we'll walk you through it. 
right? Put that back, take my Walkins here. I was, I don't know if you're a fan of comic books, but like I, I used to like the Fantastic Four, so like a lot of times the, the, the covers would be like Mr. Fantastic's hands, like like this. So every time I put my hand really close to the camera, it's like, oh, I have stretch powers. Yeah, we're on. All right, so let us sketch, all right? Based upon what we know, right? We can always confirm with our calculator um, what this function would look like. So if we have something, 3x to the fourth minus 4x to the third, because I'm not too creative. All right, uh, first thing, we're gonna pay attention to the degree. And thankfully, it's, it's already in uh, more or less the general form, it's not factored. So we could tell the degree right off the bat. All right, and we wanna consider the lead coefficient. Uh, the degree is four, all right? All right, and the lead coefficient is a positive. Since it's an even degree, we're going to have arrows in the same basic direction. Right. And since it's positive, it's going to be up, right, rather than vertically reflected down. All right. Probably is going to bear some resemblance to just like a really flat parabola. So here's a rough sketch. Um, I would just do this. Um, put an arrow basically here and here. All right, not much else to get you rolling. All right, you may have it will as the picture slowly comes into resolution as you fill it in with points. It'll narrow probably. All right, but uh, just put a non-committal <laughs> sort of arrows, same direction in the up orientation. Uh, now number two, let's consider some x-intercepts, right, i.e. the zeros. And in this case, we would have to take what is given and then factor it ourselves. So um, factor and then use the zero product rule. Okay. Um, if you want, you can use that formula, all right? The number of x-intercepts would be something either exactly equal to the degree, which is four, all right? Or something less than that. So four or less, we can expect, all right? Here is the actual thing. Three uh, x to the fourth minus four x cubed, all right? They obviously have a letter in common, so I'm going to go with the, tr the tried and true. Factor out a monomial GCF here. Amongst the letters, it would be the lower degree, so x3. And then we'll work backwards to see what would go here and here. x to the third times something would be 3x to the fourth. Well, it would just be an additional 3x. That would technically be degree one. X to the third times something would be minus 4x to the third. So the amount of x uh, degree is already accounted for, so it would just be minus 4. Right. We're going to now in, in, you incorporate the zero product rule. Right. So we're going to set this equal to zero. And then since these are now factors, right, consider two different uh, little equations. All right. Technically, this is a cubic and this is linear if you want to be technical. Um, if you wanted to solve this one, you would take the cube root, that's an opposite operation to cancel here and do the same thing here. Regardless, the cube root of zero is just gonna be zero, which means that one of them is gonna be at the location that is the origin. So you put a dot there. Right. And the other one, add four, Cancel for this one, you get a crummy fraction, but it's not too egregious, right? X is equal to four thirds, which would be one and one third, or 1.3 repeating. 1.3 repeating. So just after positive one at the location of Y zero. Right. 
So if this is one here, um, and this would be two, then you would figure it would be a dot just approximately there. Okay. Um, those are the only two factors. So it isn't the maximum that might have been. It's less than that, which would be okay, according to this. All right, so it's two. We have two x-intercepts. Again, you don't really have to bother with the y because we already have it, all right? And unless something really bizarre happens, it's not gonna cross the axis again. Um, you could if you wanted to, if you wanted to check the y. You could put zero in place of x, y, zero, zero. You're gonna get zero regardless. Um, let's consider the, um, the multiplicity, all right? These factors, right, technically, um, I'm going to erase this and put them in the factored form up here now. We have X, I should put the three there, and then, uh, three X minus four. Uh, would be one, okay? It is no coincidence that this plus this is four, all right, really. Um, I just like to be extra careful if I can help it, just to remember in other situations, but maybe there's something inside here, all right? Anyhow, we have, insofar as the multiplicity is concerned, I need the space, sorry. Multiplicity uh, that is three and a multiplicity that is one. They're both odd. Right? That means that we're going to have around those x intercepts, zero, zero, and 1.3, comma, zero, uh, the function crosses the x axis. So, um, judging by the arrow here, probably is gonna cross like that. Right. I'd be a little non-committal, just for the moment. And just judging by the arrow here, probably like that. Right. And since they're both upward pointing, what that um, implies is that there's probably a turning point here. So, turning point potentially, all right? Around, that looks like a happy face, right? <laughs> That's so cute. All right, uh, focus, Peter adults All right, um, let's consider the turning points. So I'm gonna free up some space here. To. Uh, well, if y is a uh, y intercept is step three, let's just say that four here would be uh, a turning point. Uh, all right, I can't help myself. Turning point, I'm going to call this three because I didn't bother with y really. All right, turning point again would be implied by this formula, at least to give us some idea how many there would be. All right, we already know what the degree is. The degree is uh, four. So, if the degree is four and you subtract one, get three, the number of turning points would be three or less, all right? It looks like there's just one in this case, but that's not lying, it's just not that helpful, really. It's a vague sort of validation, all right? Um, This, would, this turning point here would technically be a minimum. And again, if you were gonna do this brute force, and there's no sin in that, all right, you could try to estimate this based upon your, um, your x-intercepts. If you know that this is zero, zero, and this is 1.3, the turning point would have to be somewhere in between them. So you could test x values that would be in here to see what the y value would be, all right? And eventually what you would notice is that there's a change from decreasing as it goes down 
to a point of increasing in terms of the y value, all right? They'll be negative regardless, but it'll be uh, a lower magnitude uh, and then to get to a minimum, and then the magnitude will start to increase. Uh, well, technically the magnitude is decreasing, but the sign is approaching the axis. Magnitude is the size of the number. All right. um, let me show you something, because at a, in a situation like this, you might want to generate your own coordinates to help flesh out the picture. The whole point of this exercise is to sketch. This isn't bad, all right? But if you want to get it a little bit more precise without a calculator, then what you're going to do is you're going to generate coordinates, the old-fashioned group force way, all right? And in that event, let me turn on my projector and show you all right, what I would do. Here is that old diagram. This is from um, section 2-2, uh, two, two, I want to say, from Alamo. Four methods for graphing, whether you're just doing it the brute force way, x-intercept, y-intercept, or the slope-intercept form, if you were dealing with a straight line. This old method of generating your own dots by strategically choosing numbers, say negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, because they're low and they're easy to work with. That's gonna be useful even now with something more complicated than a line equation, right? So you don't have to use all five of them, right? But there's another sheet that's just this portion of the diagram. There's a space to work. So here, the, here that is. If you want to get maybe, let me forget some space. If you wanted to um, get a point based upon this basic sketch of just after the origin, maybe use negative one as the input, right? In the function, you could use the factored form, you could use the original form. Um, so let's say that just to help flesh out the picture, we'll generate uh, a y value at x equals negative 1. Right? If this is the original function, it's called f of x, but we just stand in place that that would be y. 3x to the fourth minus 4x to the third. Right? Then by inserting negative 1 here and here, we could see what the y value would be. So, uh, human me, I'm going to do that. Uh, putting negative 1 for the x here and here. All right. If you have an even all right, affecting this negative 1, this would really be 3 times 1, which is really 3. All right. In this instance, if you have an odd, this would end up being negative 1, 4 times negative 1, which would be minus 4. Right. Uh, oh, pardon me, there was a minus already there, though. So a double negative, because of the minus that was in the original function, it's in the dark, I'm sorry, makes this a double negative. So this is 3 plus 4 here. Right? At the location of x negative 1, you get 7. Right? So a dot that would be handy to help develop this picture a little bit more precisely would be at negative 1, positive 7. So you'd have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have a dot roughly there. Okay. It's a little dark. So here we have our upward pointing arrow. This is why I say don't be so committed about where you put it, just that it's oriented correctly. If this is part of the graph, you have now a slightly more refined version of the picture. Right? Again, strategically, try some points in here. All right, do what's easy, at least to start with. All right, we already have zero because we already got the origin. 
so it'd be silly to do that, all right? Um, you could do two, all right? Um, if you do two, you're gonna get, you know, a point over here somewhere. I'm more interested in this turning point, all right? So I'm gonna use one. Uh, three to the fourth minus four times x to the third. If I stick a positive one in here, again, I have the situation that following the order of operations, this is three times one, and this is four times one. So it's really three minus four, in this case, if we get negative one. And then you have a point at the location of one negative one which is something between these two. It's not halfway per se. Uh, but at the point of one, you'd have a dot, let's just say, this is a little bit too exaggerated, of negative one. So it's something like that. Right? If you want to see right, that this is around the turning point, you could try uh, a point just shy of one. right? Like I tried myself two thirds, right? And instead of the number two, I had tried the number two thirds, which is just shy of one, right? To see if, how this uh, behaves, right? And then inserting two thirds in place of x is what I ended up with is this, um, about 0 0.6, something like that. So it actually goes up, right? So if this is one, and two thirds would be something like right there, it goes up a little bit higher than negative one, so you'd have a dot like that. If you do just after one, again, you could see you know, that it goes up again. Right? What ends up happening, essentially, is that you have this picture, something like that, right? as a rough sketch. Okay. Now, just to confirm that, use a calculator, naturally. Clear out the mess that I had in there. We had originally 3x to the fourth minus 4x to the third. All right. I predict that the picture here would be similar on our calculator. I may have to adjust the screen dimensions again, but we'll see. All right. Yeah, that's awful. <laughs> that's not helpful. So let me hit zoom, try six. Again, sometimes if you tinker around with the settings too much, it kind of befuddles the calculator, but there you have sort of the dip, all right? Arrows would go into infinity, that's why it's off the screen, but they are upward pointing both, because it's an even degree function. And um, there's a minimum that is the turning point here, just one minimum, it seems. If you zoom in a little bit, let's see if we can get it a little bit better. Zoom in two, then you hit enter. That's better. Yeah, that's more satisfying. All right, again, you could do it brute force, but once you spot that there is just this one minimum there, all right, you could use your calculator to tell you what it is. So the minimum would apparently be a three here. All right, scoot this over close to it. That's as far to the left, perhaps, as you would like to look. And this is as far to the right as you would like to look. Let's bring it a little bit too much. Yes, and it gives you basically one negative one, right, is in fact the minimum it seems to be. Uh, just to verify, let me put one in here. Yep, negative one, all right. Okay. Now, um, let me give you a, a graph and we'll try to write an equation from the picture. So I'm gonna post a project here of graph paper. This will be the last thing for today. which I'll have available, and I mentioned it in the packet, that you could use as some kind of scaffolding to work through this 
this process of writing an equation. But it might be you might be just comfortable. So um, let's start with this. I'm going to write an equation. for a polynomial function graph. If it has these key features, I'm going to put these in red. Say you had a point, it helps to do this on graph papers so I could be more precise. Uh, let's see. Suppose you had a graph that looked like this. And I really should do this one a little bit better. Okay. So we just have these points. There's a couple of things that you could tell immediately, right? The arrows. the same direction, the same general direction. If the arrows are the same general direction, all right, what can you expect about um, the degree and the lead coefficient? The degree is probably going to be even, like parabolas are even degree, right, two. And if they both happen to be up, it's probably positive lead coefficient. Okay? Then there are uh, how many x-intercepts? We seem to be one, two, three. There are three x-intercepts, right, zeros. Um, and if you wanted to analyze those, right, uh, let's get in here a little closer. This is evidently an x-intercept that there's a crossing, right? And here it again, this is because, uh, not that that's roaring, but this is a bounce right there, instead of a crossing, just touching it. And this one is um, a cross again. So what you would expect about the, the, behave, the multiplicity here, all right, when there's a cross, there's going to be an odd p-value. Whatever that factor is, it's going to be an odd p. Right? And if there's a bounce, that means that there's going to be an even amongst the factor. There's going to be an even p value. Somebody texted him, I'm sorry. Who that is? Mystery shopper. Okay. All right. Um, some other things which I'm not going to really have to worry too much about, but there's a turning point here, which is the minimum in this case, and there would seem to be a turning point here, technically, and another turning point. Right. In this case, this is another minimum, a local, a local. And this is a maximum turning point, local maximum. All right. When you're actually writing the equation, all right, let me point at the uh, uh, handout for a moment. All right. You want to start with basically this scaffold. All right. uh, you may have several factors. That's why these ellipses are there. 
Let's start with maybe two or three of them, all right? And based upon the drawing, you could figure out according to the grid lines what the x values would be, and you would insert them in the factors. There is also this sheet, which is uh, I had made it maybe a year or two ago. A scaffolding to kind of get you jazzed for it. Here's a sort of an unofficial uh, uh, model. Factor one, factor two with P's next to it for the degrees. All right. And once you have the x-intercept numbers, write them in the style of a factor, what they would probably look like. Right? Then figure out what the degrees of the factors would be, i.e. the multiplicity. Right. And continue. this. I need a little bit of light because I can't see, unfortunately, my book here. All right, let's figure out the coordinates of these, um, and I'll write them right in the graph. This is apparently, if they're incremented in one, this is the ordered pair negative three comma zero for that x-intercept. Right. This is the ordered pair break the space, positive 2 comma 0, and this one would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so 5 comma 0. All right. If you can imagine, uh, I'll put this in red, this model that we're fleshing out numerically, A times, we'll have at least we'll have these three factors, because those are the three x-intercepts, right? It's going to be x something, x something, x something, right. If it's x negative 3, the number here would be positive 3. Right. Right. Because remember, if you were using, if this was factored and you were trying to solve for x, it would have to be the opposite sign. Uh, using the zero product rule. If this is a positive 2 here, this would be x minus 2. Right? And if this is positive 5, this would be negative 5. Okay. Um, again, considering what's going on here, this is going to have to be an odd number for the multiplicity that would be here. This is going to be an odd number affecting that particular x-intercept. This is going to be an even, and this crossing would be an odd again. Right. Let's consider that formula. Um, we know that the degree is going to be an even. This is kind of thinking about it backwards. Let me put this over here. We have this formula to calculate normally the number of zeros. Right? Give us some inkling. Right? Well, based upon the degree. We don't know the degree yet. Right? It's probably, you know, maybe two, three, or four, something like that. Um, well, if there's three of these, it would be minimally three, right? So if we have an actual number, but instead of having it here, we have it here. We know that there are three zeros and no more than that because of the, the arrows here. Um, then we can make an inference about what the degree ought to be. Right? Um, the degree would be three or, notice the orientation of this less than symbol the open end of it is facing the degree. It would have to be three or greater. Right? Normally we don't consider the question from this perspective, we do it from that perspective. So it's gotta be three or more. All right? Insofar as odd numbers are concerned, it's gonna be, what are odd numbers? One or three, right, usually? What about even numbers? It's usually two. Right? Since it's facted, all right, Use the smallest ones that you have, all right? Um, if it was, sorry, what's going 
fall asleep now. If I just went with all odds, which I shouldn't because I know that one has to be even because it's bouncing. One plus one plus one would be three, right? That's not violating that condition there, but we know that it could be more than that. So just one number higher to make it even would make sense to have this as just one for this factor, because it's just crossing as if it was linear at that point, all right? Just one for this factor, because again, it's crossing as though it were linear at that point, right? It's more or less linear linear. And then there's this one instance of where it's bending here, right? It's bouncing off the axis. Well, the most basic uh, even degree would be two, all right? So we could say that's something like a parabola at that point, right? This is, for lack of a better phrase, parabolic. You know, it's just upside down. All right. So we have our factors and we have reasonable degrees here, right? Degree one, degree two, degree uh, one again, all right? Which means that it's probably gonna be four if we were to you know, distribute this, all right? Degree four, without it being known, all right? The last thing is we would need to identify the A value, all right? In that case, to identify the A value, and I did write it on the sheet, I'll put it here. To identify A right, insert you know um, the Y intercepts coordinates. The Y intercept would be what for the zero um, for the uh, for the X component. It would have to be zero, otherwise it wouldn't be a Y intercept. If you read the graph what is it here? It's zero comma negative two. Okay. We would have enough information then to figure out what A is. Right. So, remember the stand-in for a function of X is really Y. And in place of each of these X's, all right, I'm gonna put the number negative two. Uh, pardon me, I'm gonna put the number zero. Zero here, zero here, zero here, and negative two there. All right. I need a little bit of space, so I'm going to erase some stuff. Right. So, in place of y, negative two from the intercept is equal to a, the thing that I'm looking for. In place of this x, I would put a zero, a zero, and a zero, because that's what it would be at x-intercept, which reduces this to three, and then reduces this to negative two, which we're gonna say is squared, and then this is minus five, all right? Straighten that out, rearrange it to solve for a, see what you get. Three is three, this is positive four, this is negative five, so three times four times negative five, all right? 12 times negative 5 is negative 60. Negative 2 is equal to a times what would be negative 60. Solving for a would require moving the negative 60 over here. So via opposite operations, I would divide by negative 60 and divide by negative 60 to balance. These would cancel. A would be a positive. And 2 divided by 60 left in the fractional form ratio would reduce to 1 30th. It's weird, right? So, my prediction would be that this, um, this equation to model this weirdo function would be this. Uh, y, or f of x, whichever you prefer, with a lead coefficient that is a positive 1 30th times x plus 3 times x minus 2 squared times x minus five. Okay. And just to verify again, you can use your calculator. Put that in here just not to get in trouble. I'm gonna type this in. 
this ugly thing here, and hopefully my prediction is correct. We'll see. All right. Uh, I prefer not to have egg on my face, but hey, it happens, right? So I'm going to try to enter things in a nice intuitive way. That I'm a twit, and I like the way that I've done it. Okay, so I put this, firstly, the lead coefficient in the, the intuitive fractional style here, 1 30th. Now, parentheses with those contents, parentheses with those contents, degree 2, and so forth. Right. So uh, x plus 3 times x minus 2 to the degree of 2, and then x minus 5. Right, just to show you, um, moving back this way, so you can see all of it at the same, well, most of it at the same time. This is what I've entered. I hit graph. If I have to, I'll probably have to adjust the screen dimensions. Yeah, it's a little too close. So I'm going to hit zoom and then go to standard first. And there you have it, right? Oh, that's cool, right? An arrow that curves, bounces, curves down again and goes up, right? And since that you see in the picture, thankfully, the minima and the maxima technically, you can use your calculator's function or do it brute force if you really want to. Right? To figure out those where this would be located, where that would be located, or that. Okay, that's pretty cool, right? I think so. That's it for today. Um, I'm going to look at the homework for practice for 5.2 and 5.3 primarily and see what, what will be due. And um, I'll see you again on Monday. This video is for Thursday. All right, be careful out there.